Why did the rabbi think it was necessary to state his position that fasting on the minor fast days in this generation is optional? I am quite certain that some believe that my reason for stating that position is simply to be what uh, is sometimes colloquially referred to here in Israel in Hebrew as Harav Noach. In other words, to be the, the comfortable, the easygoing, the lenient rabbi who, who always tell you that it's, it's mutar, it's permissible to do such and such. Now this, of course, is untrue. And in general, it should be stated that whatever position or statement I make on any issue, it is not in order to find favor in the eyes of some or to be considered a user-friendly rabbi, so to speak, that I make this or that pronouncement or express this or that opinion. If I express an opinion, if I give a psak halacha, it is simply and only for one reason. First of all, because I believe that is the truth. And I believe that Jews need to know and deserve to know the truth. Even if that truth sometimes is not necessarily what many Torah Jews believe to be correct. With reference to this issue of the minor fast days, and here we should mention that we refer to the following fast days, Shiva Asar Tammuz, the 17th of Tammuz, Gimel B'Tishrei, the third day of Tishrei, which is the day after uh, Rosh Hashanah, seeing that Rosh Hashanah is observed in most places by most people for two days, and Asara B'Tevet, which is the 10th day of the month of Tevet. In other words, we are not discussing Tisha B'Av, and of course, it goes without saying that we are not discussing Yom Kippurim, which is a, a totally different type of day. The fast on that day is for a very different reason. That fast is explicit and mentioned explicitly in the Torah. We are referring to the three minor fast days. This Psak Lacha is based on an explicit sugya, a Talmudic discussion in the Talmud Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud Rosh Hashanah 18a, where we learn, the big, from the sugya begins on 18a and continues on to 18b, Yov Heth Amud Beth. The sugya discusses the status of the various fa fast days, and what we learn there is that the status, the halachic status of these three minor fast days depends on the objective reality on the ground. That is to say, the Talmud tells us, Rav Papa more precisely, more specifically tells us, that there are three possible situations or sets of circumstances in which the Jewish people might find themselves. One situation is referred to as shalom, literally peace, which is in that context a, a term which means the situation is as it should be, ideal more or less. In other words, the Jewish people reside in their homeland under their own rule based on Torah values the Mikdash stands, at least this is how many of the Rishonim explain it, and that is called Shalom. That type of situation is referred to as Shalom. The opposite of that is Shemad. Shemad refers to a time when the Jewish people are either not living in their land, or it's theoretically possible this could also be the case, if, even if they are living in Eretz Yisrael, but they are ruled over by, by foreigners and they are being persecuted and not allowed to practice their religion, to study Torah, to keep the Miswoth, the commandments, etc. As has happened, unfortunately, 
in many periods of Jewish history. That kind of situation is referred to as Shemad, and in that reality, fasting on the three minor fast days is an absolute obligation. And then there is also a third possibility, which is some kind of intermediate state of affairs, referred to by the Talmud as En Shalom or En Shamad. In other words, it is neither ideal, nor is it as bad and as, as uh, disastrous as the situation might be, and perhaps was in, in certain times. So what the Talmud states is as follows. When the situation is shalom, these fast days, not only are they not obligatory fast days, they become in fact days when we rejoice and celebrate in order to recall what was and how things have improved and to thank Hashem for the very positive and essentially ideal state in which we find ourselves. The opposite is the, the situation known as Shemad, when it is obligatory to fast. And En Shalom or En Shemad, the Gemara says, Rasu Mithanim, Lo Rasu En Mithanim. Which means, if a person wishes to fast, he may do so, it is optional, but he is not required to do so. And without going into all the various sources and details now, because we have addressed this issue before, we can state simply as follows, that up to approximately a thousand years ago, or perhaps even a bit less, in most parts of the Jewish world, the Jews were living in a state of affairs that was considered and is described explicitly by the Chachamim living at, at that time, such as Rabbeinu Hananel, who says this explicitly, that we live in a time, he says, where it is en shalom or en shamad. We live in an intermediate period of time. Yes, we live in the Galuth, we do not live in Eretz Yisrael, but we are able to be Jews, study Torah, we have Jewish communities that are vibrant and active, we are not being persecuted. This was the reality in most of the Jewish world at that time. Some, at some point, historically, after that time, the situation began to deteriorate. So whereas the Geonim in Bavel and Rabbeinu Hananel, for example, tell us that in their time, fasting during those three fast days is optional, but not obligatory. Later we find that all the Rishonim, such as the Ramban and the Tur, etc., who write, referring to their own time, which is some uh, centuries, one, two, or three centuries later, they are referring to a period where fasting is obligatory. Why? Because the situation had changed. The historical situation began to change approximately a thousand or nine hundred and fifty odd years ago. The first crusade occurred or began in the year 1095 according to the Christian calendar and in other parts of the Jewish world in the Muslim world serious persecution of Jews be be began to be uh, the order of the day and the fact is, historically, that in most communities from that time onwards the situation was rather dire, in fact. There, were, there was much persecution. Jews were expelled from different countries or, or cities or provinces. Of course, later there was the Spanish Inquisition, there were the various Crusades, there were huge massacres of Jews in different parts of the world. So the situation changed objectively, and therefore it became the normal and obviously correct practice to fast on all of these fast days. And the Jewish people have been doing so, therefore, for many centuries, and we have become used to doing that without really giving, giving it a second thought. So much so that many religious Jews today continue to recite the various salihoth and uh, and chinoth, etc., 
that are recited on such days as if they were living in, the, in precisely the same type of reality in which the authors of those liturgical texts were living. In other words, in times of severe persecution, pogroms, massacres, forced conversions, etc., etc. And that is why we find to this day, even in Sidurim printed in, in Eretz Yisrael today, the, in, in some Nusha'oth you find, for example, on the, uh, in the lengthier Tahanonim recited on Mondays and Thursdays, you will find a sentence, for example, where it says, Husa Adonai Aleno Be'eretz Shivienu. Have mercy upon us, Hashem, here in our land of captivity. This is a statement which cannot and must not be said. The Pasuk in Sefer Tehilim, Perek Kof Aleph 101, states, Dover Shekharim Lo Yikon Neged Inai. A person who speaks falsely will not be able to stand, I will not allow him to stand before me. To say this when one lives in Eretz Yisrael is clearly untrue, and therefore it is a sheker, it is something which is false. But I would add that even to recite such a thing, if one lives in Antwerpen or in New York or in London or Melbourne, is equally untrue, because Jews living in these places today are not there because it is entirely beyond the realm of possibility to pick up and leave and put, place themselves in Eretz Yisrael, to return to Eretz Yisrael. This is therefore a falsehood no matter where one happens to be. Clearly it is even more obviously so if one is living in Eretz Yisrael and one says that uh, have mercy upon us, Hashem, in the land of our captivity. And the same is true of many piyutim and many kinoth that are recited uh, on different days of the year. It might be on, uh, things recited on Tisha B'Av or on the minor fast days. It is a, simply force of habit and some kind of institutionalized blindness or inability to recognize the objective reality for what it is that causes people to continue to act and to pray and also to fast as if nothing has changed. And this is not how Torah Judaism is supposed to work. And that is exactly why Rav Papa tells us in that sugya in Masechet Rosh Hashanah that this is not how we conduct ourselves with regards to these fast days. We only fast when, as an obligation if the situation warrants it. If it is not so, then it is no longer an obligation. Yes, there are still things today, both inside Israel and outside Israel, that require much prayer and thought and teshuvah, repentance, without a doubt. None of us should fool ourselves that we have reached a, uh, a time of, of uh, shalemuth, of completeness, where everything is whole and as it should be. That is certainly not the case. It is clearly false and misleading and pernicious to continue to act by rote, as it were, without thinking, to continue to fast or to recite certain prayers and in general to live in, in a kind of virtual reality in, where we are convinced or we convince ourselves somehow that nothing has changed, that we are living uh, at the same time as those piyutim or those salihot were written at the time of the, or in the wake of the first crusade or the time of the Spanish Inquisition or throughout that period of many centuries where Jews all over the world lived in fear, of, in fear for their lives. It is essential that we understand that to behave in such a way is not merely to be out of step with reality or to perhaps be more than necessary, that we are being more 
stringent than we might be, halakhically speaking, that we are fasting when we don't, we are not required to fast, perhaps. The reason for saying these things is not because it concerns me that uh, too many Jews are going hungry on a given day or are very thirsty, when in fact they don't perhaps need to be. That is not my motivation at all. Not that that is something of absolutely no concern or something that has no, carries no halachic weight, but that is not the major concern here. The major concern is to understand that it has a very deleterious, pernicious impact on our psyche, on our consciousness, and on the way we behave. Because if Jews see themselves as in no way different, essentially, from their forefathers generations ago, perhaps centuries ago, when the Jews were in fact helpless, were at the mercy of their enemies, of their non-Jewish neighbors who by and large hated them and not infrequently attacked and killed them and uh, harmed them many in many ways. If we continue to see ourselves in that light, then we are in unable, we will find ourselves unable to act and do that which is necessary, that which is required by Hashem, by the Torah, of us, that we do today. Because we are always required to act in accordance with the objective reality, with the facts, as they are. Whatever period of history we find ourselves in, we are required to consider how we can promote and further the agenda of the Jewish people as delineated in the Torah. If we are in a situation where we are helpless and at the mercy of our surroundings, then in fact, sometimes it is the case. We are unable to do anything except for pray to Hashem, cry out and beseech Hashem and fast and uh, repent and there is sometimes, sometimes no other path available beyond such necessary actions. However, in an historical context where it is possible for Jews around the world to rise up and return to Eretz Yisrael, to reconstitute the Jewish state based on Torah principles, the Mamlechet Kohanim and Goy Kadosh mentioned in Sefer Shemot, in the book of Exodus, to reconstitute our national existence in our homeland under our own independent rule as prescribed and as commanded in the Torah, where this is possible, nothing less will do. That is what we are required to strive for. That is what we are required to think about. It is those types of actions that we must undertake in order to be able to, as it were, look Hashem in the face and tell Him we are doing and have been doing and will continue to do everything in our power to bring about Your will in this world. And we know what Hashem's will is because it is there plainly before us in the Torah. And it is not Hashem's will that Jews remain in the Galuth and it is not Hashem's will that the Jews have a state in their own land but that that state functions and is run and its laws are described and decided in the same manner as the nations of the world. That is not Hashem's will. Hashem wishes us to be in, in our land and to rule our, ourselves, to be independent. Independent not just physically in the sense of being sovereign, but independent also in the sense of being who we are. Not copying mimicking the actions, the philosophies, the modalities of living of the nations of the world, not simply accepting any fad or fashion that happens to be making the rounds around the world amongst the various nations who have no compass and no direction and no, uh, no particular purpose or destiny in this world. For the Jewish people, that is never enough. For the Jewish people, there is always that which has to be done today, at this point in time, based on 
the realities, the facts on the ground. When we are in a, therefore in a situation, as we are today, of en shalom or en shamad, some kind of intermediate reality, not galuth in the fullest sense, as it was when we lived outside our land and we were at the mercy of our enemies, and, even, and not even a situation of living in our land, but not according to our Torah, on the one hand. On the other hand, not shalom either. The situation in Israel today is far, very far, from being acceptable. And we are not allowed to make do, as it were, with this kind of reality, with this kind of intermediate, mediocre, and even less than mediocre reality. We are required to strive to act to struggle to bring about the kind of Jewish state, the Mamlechet Kohanim Uroi Kadosh, that Hashem describes in the Torah. That is our purpose, and that is what we must always consider and dwell upon and act according to those thoughts and those considerations. By continuing to think, to understand our, re our reality, as individuals and as a nation, by continuing to act in the halachic realm as if nothing has changed, by con if by continuing to consider certain fast days to be obligatory as they once were, but are no more, if acting in such a way causes us to be dysfunctional, not to live up to what we are required to do, not to even understand perhaps what we are required to do, then that mode of Jewish practice and halachic thought is incorrect and is most definitely harmful. It causes damage to our understanding of Judaism, of Torah Judaism, what it is the Torah wants us, requires us to do today and tomorrow and the next day until we achieve that Bezrat Hashem, that situation, that state of, of Jewish existence referred to in the, in the Talmud in Rosh Hashanah as Shalom. And that has always been my motivation for making clear this particular halacha, this particular fact of Torah practice that we do not accept an intermediate and uh, mediocre state of existence as, as it were, either a state of shamad or as being a state of shalom, as if everything is okay and we can therefore simply relax and take it easy because things are more or less as they should be. No, that is certainly not the case. Things are not as they should be. And we must understand that everything depends on us, on what we do and what we do not do. And our actions depend on our perception, on our mental and psychological state of mind. We must, at all costs, avoid two things. Firstly, paralysis. By paralysis, I mean continuing with the Galuth mode norm of Judaism, as if nothing has changed, particularly so when Hazal themselves instruct us that this is not the way for us to proceed. When Hazal explicitly state that we must take stock of our situation, of our national situation, and modify our behavior, our halachic behavior, and thereby our appreciation and our perception of where we are on the timeline of Jewish history, specifically when Chazal make this very clear, we must avoid paralysis, the con that is to say the continuation of the Galuth norm as if it were normal because it is in fact entirely not so, it is not normal. If we understand that the norm of the Galuth 
that which Shabtai bin Dov refers to as the Hashigra HaGalutith, the, the Galuth norm of Judaism, if we understand, internalize that this is not normal, then we will act and behave differently. And that is essential. The second thing we must avoid is complacency, or if you prefer, self-satisfaction. We must not allow ourselves to be overly pleased, satisfied, and therefore complacent about our situation. Yes, we have come a long way from the historical contexts in which Am Yisrael found itself many generations and centuries ago. That is entirely true. And if a person refuses to recognize that fact, then he too is deliberately misleading himself and others and will therefore, by virtue of the fact that he's acting in a way which does not see the reality for what it is, such a person will therefore also act in a manner which is incongruous and unhelpful, and in fact, not just unhelpful, but harmful. We must not be satisfied and accepting of what there is. What there is today, what Am Yisrael has achieved over the last several generations is wonderful and is truly outstanding and in fact very difficult sometimes to, to accept. It is quite reasonable to be incredulous regarding the progress that Am Yisrael has made over the last several generations. But we must recognize that we are only halfway along the road and there is a long way ahead of us to travel until we reach our goals. If we understand our situation correctly, then we will, Bezrat Hashem, act correctly and achieve uh, the right result. We will fulfill our duty and achieve our destiny. If we continue with Galut mode Judaism, as if nothing has changed, then we will not achieve the the destiny, the aims, the agenda of Hashem in this world, which are our responsibility to bring to fruition. Amen. The production of these videos and maintaining this channel demands much time and money. If you enjoyed this video, please show your appreciation and support. To make a donation, please go to www dot machonshilo dot org and press the paypal button which appears on the upper right hand side of the home page to sponsor a video or purchase birkon nusach eretz israel please write us at office at machonshilo dot org